Welcome everyone to my uh, talk. So uh, my name is Jakub and I work for Red Hat uh, in the messaging and IoT team. And I work mainly on something what is called Red Hat AMQ Streams, which is our uh, distribution of Apache Kafka. And uh, one of the versions which Red Hat AMQ Streams has is uh, running on OpenShift. So uh, that's why I'm going to be talking today about how to run Apache Kafka on uh, Kubernetes as well as on OpenShift. Uh, how many of you have been yesterday on my talk which focused more or less only on Apache Kafka? Okay, quite a lot, but not everyone. So I will try to give uh, at least a quick introduction into what Kafka is and how it works. So uh, Kafka was originally developed at uh, LinkedIn and was later open sourced. It's kind of designed from scratch to be uh, scalable, distributed, fast, durable, available, all these cool buzzwords which uh, are important. And uh, it uh, does most of these things through data partitioning. So it's basically sharding the data into uh, different partitions, which can be then distributed across a cluster of uh, Kafka brokers and uh, used by the clients to send or receive messages. And thanks to this sharding, it is able to achieve uh, high throughput and uh, low latency, and uh, it can handle uh, quite large uh, uh, amounts of uh, consumers or producers. So a uh, few basics about how Kafka works. So uh, the messages are always sent to or received from a Kafka topic. But the topic always consists of one or more partitions. And actually, most of the operations are done on the partition level. So the consumers and producers, they usually connect directly to the partitions and uh, send the messages into a specific partition or consume the messages or read them from a specific partition. So the topic is kind of just more a virtual object which groups the partitions uh, together. And, uh, uh, so because the partitions are shards, then each message is always written only into one of these uh, shards. And to achieve high availability, each of the partitions can have always multiple replicas, where one of the replicas would be called the leader replica, and that's where the clients will be connecting. And the other replicas will be called follower replicas, and they will be just kind of replicating data from the leader and waiting, and if the leader crashes for some reason, they will kind of take over, and one of the followers will become the new leader, and will continue serving the clients. Uh, when the producer is sending the messages to the partitions, it usually does so based on a message key. So the message key is basically hashed, and uh, the partitions are used as a kind of hash table. So uh, uh, each key always, every message with the same key always ends up in exactly the same partition. And the partition is really just a commit log. So uh, the messages are written into the partition, uh, always appended at the end. And that way, uh, once they are written into the partition, the ordering is basically guaranteed for the consumers. And uh, when there is no message key in the message, so the message has basically no key or null key, then the messages are more or less distributed uh, round robin. And uh, all the time I'm talking about consumers, and the uh, API is actually called really in Kafka consumer API, but in reality they don't really consume, because when the consumers are receiving the messages from the partitions, then uh, uh, the messages always stay in the partition, and are not really removed by the consumer after they are received. So uh, uh, the partition has always something what's called retention configuration, where uh, the user when creating the topic and the partitions can say, oh hey, I want to keep the messages in this partition for some time, for example, for one hour, one day, one week, one year, or forever if he wants. Or, uh, uh, the retention can be configured based on the message size, like let's keep in the partition up to one terabyte of data, and when I get more data, let's start dropping the data. And uh, then this can be also combined if needed. And then there is kind of a special case, uh, which is called compacted uh, topic, where uh, Kafka would always try to keep the last message for uh, a given key in the topic and remove the older messages. So that's uh, 
uh, if you, for example, are writing there are some updates to some users or orders, and you are always interested only in the, in the last state, then this is very useful because you can then uh, save a lot of disk space uh, in the topics. So that's, I would say, a quick introduction into what Apache Kafka is. And uh, if you'll be interested in more details, uh, uh, I can recommend you, for example, to look at the slides from my yesterday talk where I describe it uh, a bit more into details. But this should be uh, enough for us to talk about how to run uh, Kafka on OpenShift and Kubernetes and what are the main uh, challenges. So now when we know what is Apache Kafka, Maybe we should talk about why should you actually want to run Apache Kafka on uh, something like Kubernetes or OpenShift. And uh, one of the things is that uh, Kafka is designed as a distributed and scalable. And uh, also the workloads using Kafka are usually distributed and scalable. So that's uh, quite a good fit uh, with uh, a platform like Kubernetes or OpenShift. But to be honest, uh, this alone would probably not uh, convince me uh, because uh, if you would come and ask me, hey, I want to run my Kafka cluster in uh, production, what, how should I start it? Then probably one of the first things I would recommend you is to get dedicated uh, nodes uh, instead of running the pods on the regular worker nodes uh, shared by other workloads as well. And uh, uh, so, uh, there are other reasons as well. Uh, one of them is that Kubernetes provides a great uh, abstraction. So uh, if we would try to write some tooling how to deploy and manage Kafka in all the different public clouds and on-premise environments, that would be really hard for us because even through the risk tooling, it's always a bit complicated. There's always some differences. And Kubernetes gives us this great abstraction where we can just use the Kubernetes primitives and not really care so much whether we run on uh, Amazon and we are using the EBS volumes or whether we run on OpenStack and we are using Cinder volumes as the persistent storage. So we don't really need to care and Kubernetes takes care of it. Uh, there is also this uh, notion of making everything feel like a cloud. So, uh, you know, when you use some AWS services, for example, uh, you know how it works. You go to the page for the service, you then click something like new database, select some parameters, uh, then click apply or deploy, and in a few minutes you have a database available and you can just connect to it and use it. And uh, Kubernetes allows us to do pretty much exactly the same. Uh, in all of these environments, uh, whether it's Kubernetes or OpenShift running in Amazon, Azure, on-premise, we can everywhere give the user this kind of feeling that they just uh, request a Kafka cluster and it just takes a few minutes and the Kafka cluster is deployed and can be used. And then uh, last but not least, I think it's one of the very important uh, reasons uh, for many of our users is that uh, a lot of companies or organizations are adopting more and more OpenShift and Kubernetes to run all their other workloads. And uh, to be honest, why should they learn how to operate something new somewhere else outside of OpenShift if all their operation staffs and all their people are trained uh, to work with OpenShift and Kubernetes and all of them kind of understand it, then it's probably most efficient for them to run everything on OpenShift or Kubernetes and uh, reuse this knowledge. So that was the why and now uh, we are getting to the way how to do it. So uh, there was a lot of operator talks already at that DEF CONF and I'm quite sure that uh, there will be some more. So how many of you have been already to some talk which uh, talked about operators? See, almost uh, half of you. So as everyone else, we are using the operators as well. And uh, you know, deploying the software into Kubernetes or OpenShift, that's quite easy. And uh, you can really do that just uh, with a bunch of YAML files or with some Helm chart. Uh, the operator maybe can do this a bit better that you nicely configure all the stuff in some custom resource. But uh, yeah, it isn't really that much uh, different and that much difficult to do it directly with some YAML files. But uh, keeping the stuff running, that's really the hard part. And if you want to run something in production, you know, whether you install it five minutes or whether you install it one week, 
that's not that important. The important thing is whether after you install it, whether the software will run for five minutes, for one week, or for three years. And uh, that's where I see the biggest benefit of the operators, because they can uh, uh, help you through the whole uh, life cycle of the application. They can help you with things like upgrades. They can help you with things like uh, certificate renewals. Uh, they can help you with things like uh, cluster balancing. And that's why uh, our answer to running uh, Kafka on OpenShift and Kubernetes is a project called Streamzy, which is, uh, of course, an open source project. And uh, what it provides is uh, a container images uh, with uh, the different components, so Apache Kafka, Apache Zookeeper, and so on. But it also provides the operators. And uh, kind of our aim in this project is to give the users uh, Kubernetes native experience for running uh, Kafka on uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift. And uh, how many of you used some operators or worked uh, with them or have some idea how they work? It's not that many. But basically, the way how it works is uh, you install the cluster operator. It's usually just running as a deployment or as a pod in your cluster. And then you create something what's called custom resource. The custom resource is basically just an uh, extension of uh, the Kubernetes API, which allows you to configure and define new things. So in our case, what you define with this custom resource will be a Kafka cluster. And once you create this resource, the operator will see it, and it will automatically start deploying the cluster. So uh, Kafka has a dependency on Zookeeper. So the operator first needs to deploy the Zookeeper cluster and make sure the cluster kind of bootstraps and uh, communicates and works. Afterwards, we can go and deploy the Kafka cluster, which uh, will then basically the Kafka nodes will connect with each other, but they also connect to the Zookeeper cluster, which they use to find other nodes and store some metadata and configuration. And last but, uh, last, uh, but not least, uh, we deploy something what we call topic and user operators, which uh, are used uh, later to manage topics and users in the Kafka cluster, and uh, I will talk a bit more about them in a few slides. So uh, let's uh, have a quick look uh, at an actual demo, which will uh, show how this works in reality. So I have an OpenShift uh, running locally here. It's uh, OpenShift 3.9, because uh, in Streamzy, we support OpenShift and Kubernetes uh, 1.9 and higher. And uh, first, what I need to do is I need to install the uh, Streamzy operator. And uh, that's done, uh, or I will do it here using uh, just a bunch of YAML files. So it's kind of the usual stuff. Uh, there are some RBAC files which give the operator the different roles and access rights uh, to the Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster. Then there are some uh, custom resources. That's these uh, extensions to the Kubernetes API, which allow you to define the Kafka cluster. And then the operator itself, it's really just a regular deployment like any other application. So all I need to do is to do OC apply. And it will create all these resources and start the cluster operator. And now when I want to deploy the Kafka cluster, I need to create this uh, custom resource describing the cluster. So uh, I hope you can all see this. Uh, maybe I can uh, try to do it without colors. Maybe the red one is not the best one to read. So what you can see here is uh, that uh, I'm creating uh, just a regular resource. It looks like all the other Kubernetes resources. But the API version is actually something called kafka.streamz.io. And the resource kind is called Kafka. So that's our own resource which configures the Kafka cluster. And then you can see your different options for the, for the, which configure the Kafka cluster. Like uh, here I, for example, say that I want to have three Kafka brokers in the cluster. I specify how much uh, memory and CPU it should get. I configure some authentication and authorization. I use some specific uh, Kafka configuration options. I configure the storage. 
because we have the zookeeper, I have to configure the zookeeper as well. And I pretty much summarize the configuration nicely in this custom resource. And then all I need to do is to do again OC or kubectl apply. And uh, the user operator, uh, the uh, streamz operator will see it. And as you can see, it is already deploying the zookeeper cluster. So we have three pods which are already starting. And after the cluster, so the pods have a built-in health checks. And once they are ready and once the cluster works, the operator will move on to uh, start deploying the Kafka cluster. Now it's deploying the Kafka cluster and uh, so on. So it will work exactly as in the animation on the slides. Uh, one after one, it will deploy the clusters and the pods. Now, uh, once the cluster is running, you can also decide to change some of these configurations. So uh, when uh, you change the configuration, you basically just edit the Kafka custom resource. You change there whatever you want to change. And then uh, the cluster operator will see the change and will automatically apply the change to the cluster. So for example, for many of the changes, a restart of the, uh, of the different clusters will be needed. And in that case, kind of the operator will uh, take uh, down the pods kind of one by one to make sure that uh, the Kafka cluster is still running, is still available, that your applications can use it uh, while uh, the update is going on. And uh, uh, only when the pod which was terminated is started again and is part of the cluster, then it will kind of move on and shut down the next pod and start it again and so on. So this way you can update the configuration and uh, uh, if you have used topics which have these replications or which have multiple copies, then uh, your clients should pretty much have no problems to work during this update because when one of the brokers is shut down, then one of the follower replicas should take over and should be able to serve the clients uh, while it's shutting down and starting and so on. So we can have a look again uh, at uh, how it works. So uh, with these custom resources, I can really do just something like uh, OC edit Kafka, and now name of my Kafka cluster. And it gives me a text editor where I can really just edit the YAML stuff. So I will do some simple change. So I will, uh, this auto create topics enable option defines whether when a client connects to the Kafka broker and tries to produce messages or consume messages from some topic, whether this topic will be automatically created or whether you actually have to first create it with uh, the Kafka API. So what I will do, I will change this to false so that it doesn't create these topics automatically. And now uh, what happens is uh, that the streams the operator sees that there was some change to the configuration and uh, we'll basically start rolling down uh, the first pot of the cluster. So you can see that the, my cluster Kafka zero is already terminating. And uh, once it terminates, which takes some time, then uh, it will start a new version of this pot. It will wait until this new version becomes ready and then it will basically move to the next one. So uh, then it will continue with uh, my cluster Kafka one. So you can see that it's still terminating in uh, a moment. We should see that it starts starting the new pod. Question? Yep. Uh, does this uh, uh, operator support the setup that there are two Kafka nodes and the, the, the additional zookeeper witness node? Like the dedicated zookeeper uh, uh, master node? Yes, it's the recommended setup because uh, if you overload Zookeeper, the, the whole thing goes down. So, so I run Kafka like having two nodes, uh, Zookeeper on each of them, and the third node, which is just the additional Zookeeper. Is, is the operator able to work in, in this uh, setup? So the question was uh, whether the operator is able to run uh, two Kafka nodes with collocated Zookeeper and uh, then one additional node with separate Zookeeper. And uh, yes, we are able to do this. So when you are editing, so I 
intentionally try to keep this custom resource a bit simple, but you can add there the affinity and tolerations rules. So you can really configure in detail in together with uh, how Kubernetes uh, works. You can set up dedicated nodes for both Kafka and Zookeeper, and you can basically configure it itself, yourself whether the Kafka and Zookeeper nodes should run on the same nodes or whether they should run on a separate nodes and so on. So you can really do this. And in the documentation, we have some kind of procedures and guidance uh, how exactly you should uh, configure this. But we are pretty much using the uh, kind of Kubernetes and OpenShift primitives uh, to do this. Yep. So in the Streamzy project, we have a Helm charts, which are basically for deploying the operator itself. And uh, uh, we don't really want to support deploying Kafka out without the Helm charts. But you can deploy the operator with the Helm charts. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't repeat the question for the video. So the question was whether we are supporting Helm. <laughs> uh, so you can see that the rolling update is going on. So the first uh, broker with index zero is already running. Now it's terminating the second broker. It's quite boring to just watch the pods terminate and start, right? So uh, let's get back uh, to the slides. <laughs> And let's talk a bit more about the other operators which we have. So uh, it's uh, a bit like Inception, right? So it's operators deploying operators which deploy operators. But uh, right now it seems that that's really the future, at least on OpenShift. So uh, in the Streamzy project, we wanted to do a bit more than just manage the Kafka clusters. Uh, because uh, if you run the Kafka cluster on OpenShift, then if you use all these YAMLs and custom resources to deploy the cluster, why should you then go and learn all the different uh, Kafka commands for creating users or creating <laughs> topics and kind of uh, run them the old school way from some command line? And that's why we created the user and topic operators, which uh, basically give you the Kubernetes native way for managing the topics and the users as well. So again, it works in the same principle as uh, the cluster operator. You configure some custom resource, which uh, defines the user or the topic, and the user and the topic operator, which are always deployed kind of for each Kafka cluster, will then uh, watch for them, and when you create them, they will automatically create the user or create uh, the topic. And one of the advantages of this is that uh, when you have some application which is using some topics or connecting to Kafka, you have basically everything in uh, YAMLs, right? So you have YAML with the application deployment if it runs uh, inside Kubernetes. You will have a YAML with the user definition, and you will have a YAML with definition of the topics which it is using. And you can easily store all of these somewhere in GitHub and then just do OC apply on the whole directory, for example, or you can have it in one big file. And everything will be created and deployed uh, for you. And you don't really need to uh, uh, do anything else. You don't need to run any commands to install your application, uh, anything like that. The topic operator is a bit special because there's a lot of Kafka applications which will uh, connect to the Kafka brokers and they will create their uh, topics uh, kind of on demand. So they will use the Kafka APIs to do that. And uh, that means that uh, we cannot always see the custom resources as the single source of truth for the topics. Because if the application connects to the broker, creates the topic with name my topic, and the operator would see, oh, hey, there's no custom resource with a topic named my topic, then the usual operator approach would be, okay, there is no custom resource, so this topic should not exist, and it will go and delete the topic in uh, Kafka, and then the application using this topic will not really like it, right? Uh, maybe they will just play a ping pong and they will be creating and deleting the topic. Maybe the application will start crashing or something. So that's why the topic operator is a bit special. And what we do there is we try to do this kind of bidirectional synchronization between the Kafka topics and the custom resources. We don't see the custom resources as a single source of truth. And when, for example, the application creates the topic directly in Kafka, then what the topic operator does is it will uh, create uh, the custom resource of the Kafka topic type inside your Kubernetes cluster so that you can kind of use that then to manage uh, the topics as well. And uh, 
So it does this bidirectional synchronization and there's a diffing mechanism that it can reconcile if different things are changed in the different places around the same time. So to again uh, show a bit more about this. So uh, I have here a simple application. It's an address book application. Those uh, who were on my talk yesterday saw something similar. Uh, this is a bit different, so this version is not using a database, but it's basically an address book which is using Kafka as the only state store which it has. So uh, uh, all the contacts in this address book application, they will be basically stored inside Kafka as uh, messages. And uh, uh, thanks to that, we don't really need any database or anything. Uh, like that. But what's more important for this talk is uh, how the YAML looks like for deploying this application. So you can see that uh, I start with this API version Kafka Streamsy.io and kind Kafka topic. And the topic is named uh, address book here because the topic operator and the user operator are running uh, uh, specifically for the given Kafka cluster. I always have to use the label to say kind of, okay, this topic should be created on the cluster, which is called my cluster. And then I just specify the details about the topic configuration. So in this case, I want to have three partitions and three replicas. I uh, want to have the commit lock segments for the topic uh, 10 megabytes big, and I want to use the compacting cleanup policy so that uh, it tries to keep always only the latest uh, state for the contacts. And then in a similar way, I'm defining the user. So uh, that's this uh, kind Kafka user. The user is again named uh, address book. And I can here specify that I want to use the authentication uh, type TLS, which means uh, the authentication will be done using the TLS client certificates. And uh, then I can specify a bunch of ACLs which say, okay, uh, this user should be able to write to a topic called address book. Uh, it should be able to create this topic. It should be able to read from this topic as well. And when this resource is deployed, the user operator will see it. And because we are using the TLS client authentication, it will automatically create a secret where it will generate the user certificate for uh, this user. And uh, Inside the application, I don't really need to do, when the application is running inside the same uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster, I don't really need to do any exporting of the certificate and loading it somewhere else. I basically just uh, map the certificate created by the user operator from, uh, uh, from the secret, which was created into environment variable and use it to connect uh, to the broker. So uh, with this YAML file prepared, all I need to do is uh, OC apply, and it creates uh, everything for me. And uh, I didn't really need it to log into Kafka. I didn't need it to know any Kafka specific commands. Everything is described inside this uh, single YAML. And when I go now uh, back to the console, you can see that the application is running, and uh, you can see that I can add uh, some uh, contacts. So add and uh, now it takes some time but uh, because it's starting but uh, it will eventually be there. <coughs> so this is kind of the marketing part of the presentation which shows how easy it is to run uh, Kafka and the applications. There's a lot more features which uh, we support. I don't really want to spend all the time going through them. Uh, just the main ones, uh, apart from uh, deploying Kafka clusters, we can also manage uh, Kafka Mirror Maker and Kafka Connect uh, as well. So it's not just the brokers, it's also the other Kafka components. And we can do all the different stuff, scale down, scale up, uh, authorization, authentication, uh, affinity, monitoring using Prometheus, uh, uh, everything. So there's really a lot of features. If you are interested specifically in them, 
might be best to have a look at the documentation. And if you would have some questions, talk with us uh, on Slack, Twitter, email, or everything. Uh, because we will anyway not manage to get through this uh, all in 20 minutes. So instead, I want to talk a bit more about the challenges of running something like Kafka on uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. And uh, to be honest, running stateful applications is still quite hard on Kubernetes and OpenShift. And uh, I know some people might say, uh, why is it uh, hard? We have the stateful sets. They are called stateful sets, so they should make every stateful applications uh, very simple to run. So uh, it's not really the case that's that wrong. Uh, the stateful sets basically provide just the primitives, just the building blocks. The main thing which they give you is that when you use the stateful set, your pods won't have this random address uh, with some generated characters, but they will have a stable name which is always the same. And that's important for many stateful applications which uh, are using some custom clustering because uh, that makes it easier for these applications to find the other nodes of the cluster and connect with each other. But uh, in general, most of the applications which have some clustering have a different way how the clustering is configured, how uh, the different cluster nodes discover each other, how they elect the leaders and so on. So to be honest, it's quite hard for Kubernetes to offer something more. In our case, Kafka is using the Zookeeper to do pretty much all of these things. So uh, that's why we first need to deploy the Zookeeper cluster before we deploy uh, uh, the Kafka cluster. And uh, when we are deploying the Zookeeper cluster, we basically need on the beginning, Zookeeper creates the cluster in the way that in the configuration file, you actually have to list the addresses uh, and ports of all the other uh, Zookeeper servers which should be part of that cluster. So uh, this is something what the operator helps to generate that helps to bring the zookeeper together. And uh, then uh, with Kafka, it's then a bit easier because uh, Kafka just uses zookeeper to do all these things like elect the leaders and discover the other nodes. So once the zookeeper is running, deploying Kafka is uh, fairly simple. You just point it to the zookeeper and it uses zookeeper to find all the other nodes. Uh, zookeeper is really quite challenging. In some configurations, it's basically impossible to uh, scale it up or down without uh, losing a quorum. And when you lose the quorum, it's a problem because it means uh, you will have some disruption, some outage of the Kafka cluster. So that was one of the challenges which we had to overcome to make Zookeeper work. Then uh, the other one is more uh, philosophical. So uh, an operator like Streamzy needs to be able to handle a lot of different uh, use cases, and it's really wide range, right? So you want to be able that the developers just start their mini shift and deploy the uh, Kafka cluster using Streamzy on mini shift with uh, just a few gigabytes of RAM which they have on their laptops and so on, right? So uh, that's kind of one end of the spectrum. The other end is uh, we actually want the enterprises to be able to deploy uh, huge clusters with tens of nodes and uh, dedicated Kubernetes or OpenShift hosts and a lot of memory, a lot of disks and so on. So that's the other end of the spectrum. We're waiting for this to happen. Then uh, another kind of side of this is uh, you want this to be super easy for the developers uh, to deploy and just run the Kafka cluster so that they really just do single OC apply and they get all the features. But then for the production, every customer has slightly different requirements, uh, slightly different setup of their data center. So you need to also give there a lot of flexibility for the expert users so that they can set up Kafka in the best way for their particular use case. And uh, then when you add all these options for the flexibility, that's super great, but that of course sometimes makes the configuration a bit hard and complicated because uh, when uh, you have all these options, which I listed on one of the previous slides uh, in the CRD, the CRD is actually quite huge and is really hard to read. So uh, that makes it kind of less user friendly. So these are all the things which when writing the operator, you need to kind of try to balance and sometimes you need to decide a bit uh, whether you want to make it super easy for the users who just want to get it run somehow and don't care how 
and uh, make it also interesting for the uh, experts who want to do some very specific setup. Another challenge is uh, which versions of Kubernetes and OpenShift are you going to support, right? It's still very much work in progress in some areas and every single release has uh, a lot of new cool features and uh, it's always very tempting to sit down and start playing with these new features in the latest Kubernetes release and uh, get your operator to use them somehow. But at the same time, a lot of the users, they are not really running Kubernetes 113. When you have OpenShift users, there's no OpenShift version based on Kubernetes 1.13, for example, right? So most of the users will be running some older versions and uh, you need to make, uh, either you need to really put the effort into the code to make the operator use the new features on the new versions, but use only the old features on the old versions, which can be quite a lot of effort because uh, it's not always easy to do that. Or you need to kind of say like, uh, oh, hey, we decided to do compatibility with this version and higher. And uh, the, the new features, maybe over the time as more users move to the newer versions, we will start using them. And that's pretty much what we did as the decision with the Streamsy project where we basically said that uh, Kubernetes 1.9 and OpenShift 3.9 are our baseline. And uh, we want to support that and everything newer. And uh, that's why we don't always use the latest uh, features from the latest releases. The good thing about Kubernetes is that, in general, they have a very good compatibility. So if you have something what's running and working on 1.9, uh, there's only very little problems with uh, using that on uh, 1.13, for example. So that's uh, the very good aspect how the APIs uh, are handled. And then one of the things which we had a lot of discussions uh, about is this question custom resources or config maps and uh, that a bit ties to another problem which is uh, the RBAC right so the access control which is part of the open shift so uh, using the custom resources that you have really the Kafka type resource and you have the nice structure of the features that makes it easy to use for the users when they have it installed but to install the custom resources, for example, the user needs to have usually cluster admin rights, which a lot of the users who are using some shared uh, enterprise clusters, they don't really have these rights, right? So that was another decision which we had to make. We decided to support the custom resources. Uh, I think it's worth it, but we had a lot of discussions about it because uh, it makes it really harder for some of the users to use. And now one of the big challenges for Kafka was uh, accessing Kafka from the clients. Now, if you are running something like a web servers, that's usually quite easy. So you have some service or some load balancer, the requests are coming to the service and they are just routed randomly to one of the web servers. So sometimes it's a bit more complicated because you want sticky sessions and so on. But in general, you often don't care so much which of the web servers, for example, serves some static files with some uh, images and so on. With Kafka, this is a lot more complicated because if you remember what I talked about in the beginning, the producers or the consumers, they need to connect to a specific partition to produce or consume the messages. And the partition is always uh, running on a specific uh, uh, node of the cluster. So for example, imagine I have a topic uh, called my topic, which has three partitions. So the message is sent to or received from the partition zero. Maybe they would be always on this spot, whereas the partition two will be maybe on this spot. So when the producer wants to send the messages to a different uh, partitions, it will need to maintain the connections to all the pods, but also it needs to know, that, okay, okay, now I'm connecting to the broker zero, now I'm connecting to the broker one. So the way this works is, uh, that when you are trying to access it from inside your Kubernetes cluster, we have two services. One is kind of the headless service, which pretty much just gives the pods uh, a stable host names. And then other one is the bootstrap service. And the bootstrap service, that's just a regular cluster IP service. And when the client tries to connect to Kafka, it first opens a connection to the bootstrap service and the bootstrap service basically routes the connection to one of the Kafka pods. And this is pretty much random. I made the arrow here to the 
bottom one, but uh, it can go to the one on the top. It doesn't really matter because this connection is used by the client only to request the metadata about the Kafka cluster. So whichever node it connects to, it will send it the metadata for the whole cluster. And the metadata say something like, uh, oh, hey, the my topic partition zero, that's hosted on the broker zero, which has uh, this particular address. The partition one is hosted on another broker, which has this address. And the client gets this metadata and uses these addresses to uh, connect uh, directly to these different pods and opens these kind of subsequent connections, which are then used to send and receive the messages. Now, uh, if I have a quick look into the console and open one of the Kafka brokers, then on the beginning of the log, we have actually the, the configuration file. And here you can, for example, see, I hope you can see it, I will zoom it a bit. So here you can, for example, see the configuration of the advertised listeners. These are the addresses which the Kafka brokers are telling to the client that they should connect to. So you can see that this broker tells the clients to connect to uh, the address mycluster Kafka Brokers dot my project dot service dot cluster local and so on. So this is what the broker will send to the clients, and this is what the clients will use to open these subsequent connections. Now, uh, outside Kubernetes, it's a bit harder because if your application is running outside Kubernetes or OpenShift, it cannot really use the internal Kubernetes DNS host names to connect to the pods. So unfortunately, a lot of the users don't have all the applications running inside Kubernetes or OpenShift, right? They have a lot of legacy stuff or new stuff which is simply running outside. So how do we do it from uh, outside? We have still these uh, headless and bootstrap services but we have also these pair pod services. And these pair pod services always uh, route the user to the specific pod. And these can be, for example, load balancer types so that they create the load balancers and so on. And when the client is connecting, it then connects first uh, through the bootstrap service again randomly to one of the Kafka brokers, gets the metadata. But now for the access from the outside, the address which it would get in the metadata would be not actually the host name of the pod, but will be, for example, the IP address of the load balancer which was created for the service. And in general, in streams, we can do this in three different ways. So on OpenShift, we can use OpenShift roads to access the Kafka cluster. It's a bit heck because Kafka traffic is TCP and the roads are designed for HTTP. But if you kind of pretend that it's HTTPS connection which is passed through the router into the Kafka pod, then uh, the router actually doesn't know that it's TCP inside, so uh, it works fine. And then we can use load balancers or node ports. The load balancers, uh, it a bit depends on your cost for the load balancer is because uh, uh, if you have 10 brokers in your cluster, you will always need 10 plus one load balancers uh, to use the load balancers. And then we support node ports, which are kind of the fastest from the performance, but you actually have to expose uh, the nodes directly to the clients which are connecting. So uh, that's uh, uh, a bit unsecure, or at least considered a bit unsecure. And uh, that's pretty much it. One more thing. Uh, most operators are written in Go, but uh, Streams is written in Java, so you can do operators in Java as well. And uh, the demos and the link to the slides, you can find it on this uh, URL if you want to have a look <coughs> at it later. And uh, that's it from me. And uh, if you have any questions, I think we still have five minutes. Yeah? So uh, the question was uh, whether we plan or whether we do support or plan support uh, access from outside through ingress. And yes, it is on our to-do list. We haven't gotten to it yet. There are also uh, 
I know there were some issues with this uh, TLS pass-through with the ingress controllers. I think they have been fixed in the latest versions, but uh, that's what stopped us on the beginning. But it's on our to-do list, I hope, sooner or later we support it as well. Yeah? So uh, the question was about other components like the schema registry. Uh, yeah, to be honest, it's on our to-do list as well. Uh, we have to see and think a bit about uh, licensing because we want to use uh, really open source components which everyone can use for whatever purpose. Uh, and the schema registry license, I think it changed recently to this Confluent license, which uh, is... Uh, not as easy as the Apache License 2.0 or something like that, but we have plans to support them. Uh, basically, once it's implemented, it would either specify it as part of the Kafka custom resource or it will have a, its own custom resource to get deployed. And uh, we will get to it as well. So uh, the question was uh, why, basically, why did we do this in Java and why put the effort instead of using something like the operator SDK? So uh, to be honest, when we started with this, there was no operator SDK. Uh, so uh, it's not something what we are working on uh, for a month or two, but it's really long time effort. And uh, we have chosen Java because uh, Java has a good uh, API support for Kafka, which uh, Go doesn't have that well, doesn't have such a nice admin API client for managing the different Kafka aspects and so on. So uh, that uh, was one of the reasons. And to be honest, the other reason was that uh, most of the team members working on this were more familiar with Java than with Go. Um, maybe now with the operator SDK, it would be a lot easier to write the operators in Go. But when we were starting, I'm not sure whether writing it in Java really meant uh, bigger effort uh, than writing it from scratch in Go. Yeah? Uh, do you plan to extend this, uh, this operator in Java to include, for example, operation metering? So uh, the question was whether we plan to extend it to include operator metering. And uh, to be honest, I need to learn a bit more about operator metering. We were looking into it. Uh, I think sooner or later we will get there. We, for example, are already part in OpenShift 3.11. We were included in this operator hub, uh, which was tech preview there. So we are, it's easy to integrate it with the operator lifecycle manager. And I think we will in the future integrate with the metering as well. But uh, we don't have any integration today. Yeah? Uh, sorry, once again? Can the operator upgrade Kafka? Yeah, the question was whether the operator can upgrade Kafka. And uh, yes, the latest, so that's not in the 0.9 version which I was using in the demo, but we have it implemented now in master and we will release the 0.10 version of Streamzy with support for Kafka upgrades uh, probably next week. And uh, it's kind of semi-automated, semi-manual process. So we don't really want to upgrade. If you know how Kafka upgrades, it's a bit more complicated because ideally you should upgrade the clients as well. And you should make sure that the uh, kind of uh, protocol version is the same between the clients and broker and so on. So basically the way it's implemented is uh, you can use the custom resource to basically tell the operator which versions it should be using for these different parts. So you can say, okay, now move the broker to, from Kafka 2.0 to Kafka 2.1, but first use the old version of the protocol for storing the messages and communicating with the clients. And then in the next steps, you can kind of upgrade uh, the uh, protocol as well. So the operator does most of the things for you but you basically still have to tell the operator, oh, hey, please uh, do the upgrade, because at the end, you will be the one upgrading the clients. The operator cannot do it for you. Yep? Um, Red Hat offers also AMQ. What are the use cases where it makes sense to use AMQ or operate Streamzy or the other way around? So uh, 
the AMQ product from Red Hat contains many different components. And one of them is this AMQ streams components, which is basically the Streamsy product pro project offered by Red Hat. And then there is, for example, the AMQ broker, which is the more traditional. And uh, it really depends on the use case, which one is better. So uh, it's, uh, I would say, a bit longer discussion. And I think we just run out of the time. So if you want, I will be outside after the talk, and we can uh, continue with this, as well as with all the other questions you might have. Thanks for coming. Thank you.